Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. You know, we have in 21st century Western world quite the fascination with stuff, things. We like to accumulate things. We find comfort in things. Um, sometimes you hear people speak of it as retail therapy. They're feeling a little down. What do they do? And you go out and buy something. If they buy something, they feel better. Or if uh, there's something we feel like we're lacking, we, we go online and we look for it and we order it online and have it delivered right to our home. And uh, if there's two, I think, uh, manifestations of this preoccupation with stuff that uh, I witness as I encounter people, on the one hand, there is um, the issue of hoarding. And people will just refuse to throw things away and they just keep stuff and they collect stuff and uh, they go to yard sales and buy stuff that other people are trying to get rid of and they bring it and add it to their collection of stuff and uh, fill up every bit of storage space they have and, and everything in their house is just filled with stuff. And the idea is, well, you know what, I might need this one day. Well, while we would never come out and say it blatantly, what hoarding does for us is says, I don't trust God, that if I do, in fact, need something that at the time of need, God will provide it. Now, I understand the 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 um, the benefit and uh, I think the wisdom, biblical wisdom in planning ahead and setting some things aside. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there is a time to gather stones. But it also tells us there's a time to throw away stones. There's a time for gathering. There's a time for throwing away. And uh, a lot of times hoarding is just a sign of not trusting that God will provide at the moment of need. And I've got to make sure that I have on hand what I'm going to need because I've got to provide it for myself. On the other end of the spectrum is uh, debt high debt. And I understand there's a lot of debt that comes about by necessity. Unexpected bills, medical bills, um, emergencies that happen and things like that. And when you're tight on money, it's hard to pay that off. But sometimes, a lot of times, uh, Americans especially amass a great deal of debt buying stuff they really don't need. They just want they see something they want, maybe on an impulse, or maybe they've been eyeing it for a while, and they think, well, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll charge it, and I'll pay it off later. You say that too many times, and the ability to pay it off gets constricted by the volume of things we're trying to pay off. And we think we find our satisfaction, we think we find some value, or for once have some peace in the things that we possess. And either one of those belies a lack of trust in God. Uh, we either believe that God is not good and we need no other and that he is not sufficient and that we find our ultimate joy and satisfaction in him or else we fail to believe that God uh, is good and will provide for us at the moment that we need it and that God is great and he's in control of our life and can bring to us what we need. Well, all of that I say, to bring us to the 10th commandment. Yes, today we're going to look at the last of the 10 commandments and kind of the New Testament um, application of those. And as we look at this last commandment, it addresses, um, like so many of these commandments, where we live today, our, our, the preoccupation with stuff. So I encourage you to stick around. We're going to kind of look at uh, what that commandment is and uh, how we can get to the heart of why that commandment is a commandment, and then how we can apply that in our lives today. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we'll go to our scriptures in Exodus chapter 20. So join me as we pray. Father, thank you for giving us your word. It's clear and true word to instruct us, to reveal yourself to us, uh, to, to build our faith, to give us documented reason why we should trust you. So let your word Come alive in our understanding today. You give us hearts that hunger and thirst for your righteousness to find our satisfaction and to find our glory in you, not in the things that we can amass. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now let's turn to our scripture. Our 10th commandment today, we turn to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. Let's read this together and um, then we'll just kind of get into how we can apply that here in the 21st century. You shall not covet, and there's the, there's the operative word, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet his male servant or his female servant, his ox, his donkey, and just in case he left anything out of the list or anything that is your neighbor. You shall not covet. This deals with ownership, respect, and greed. Um, understand that what is your neighbor's is your neighbor's and not yours. So this idea of coveting is desiring something just because your neighbor has it. And in this case, desiring the specific thing, not just coveting a house because your neighbor has a house, but coveting the very house your neighbor has. Not coveting a wife just because your neighbor has a wife, but coveting his very wife. In other words, finding your satisfaction in something other than what you have. Here's the life principle we can look at behind this. Because God is good, we don't have to look elsewhere for satisfaction. So as God was giving these commands to his people, how they would live and relate to each other, he wanted to make it clear that you respected your neighbor and you respected your neighbor's things. You didn't try to match your neighbor or steal from your neighbor or get from your neighbor and that you didn't even let it get to the heart. Now, a lot of these other commands that we have in Exodus 20 are, you know, pretty verb centered, action centered. You know, you shall not kill. I mean, you know, that's a very active verb that you would play out or lie, you know, or disrespect a parent, you know, something like that. Those are things you know, bear false witnessing, uh, committing adultery. These are very open, tangible activities. But coveting is a secret attitude. Coveting, in essence, says, what I have is not enough. What I have is not enough. It's, uh, it's being unthankful for what you do have. It's being envious and jealous of what somebody else has. And, and as I've said, we, it, it really, it kind of indicates that we don't believe in the goodness of God, or at least that he is good to us. So as we look at this, what I want us to, I want to consider a couple of other passages of scripture that kind of remind us of the goodness of God. Romans chapter 8 is just one of the most absolutely powerful chapters in the Bible. You hear me refer to it often. I call it vitamin B for the soul. Uh, what shall we say to these things? Paul begins to close out that chapter. If God is for us, who can, not, who can be against us? So start with that phrase. That is a reality right there. God is for us. That's a reality that we can take to the bank and we can depend on. Now, the ramifications of that are that why does it matter if anybody else is against us when the creator of the universe is for us? Now, how did he demonstrate that? How did he show that he's for us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously Give us all things. God is good. And because God is good, from his grace, not because of our merit, uh, not because of us earning it, God's not going to give us what we deserve. God's going to give us more and better than we deserve. He's going to graciously give us all things. We could turn to Matthew 6, where Jesus talked about um, the sparrows, and he talked about the lilies, 
And that if God took care of all of those, how will he not also make sure we have all that we need? He'll feed us and clothe us and make sure we have shelter. He's going to take care of us um, out of his grace. And so it's not up to us. We, we don't trust in things to give us peace, to give us security, to give us satisfaction. We look to God. Second verse that speaks to this very clearly is that God uh, in the book of James, the Bible says every good gift. Now I want to mark that off. And every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from who? The Father of lights. This is a reminder to us that God is all-knowing. Light is often in the New Testament used to remind us of knowledge and wisdom. Well, the Father of that, the one from whom all knowledge comes, the one who created knowledge, who, who beget, begets knowledge, uh, coming from him, the very source of knowledge itself, he has given us every good gift and every perfect gift. And from this light, there is a no variation. That means there is no, no, um, what's the word? It doesn't get dingy, you know, um, it doesn't get um, rusty. God's knowledge does not lose its quality. There is no B, shadow due to change. Uh, it doesn't fade. It doesn't wane and wax. Um, God's light, God's knowledge, God's omniscience, is all he always brings his A game. He is the epitome of the A game. And because of that, he brings, first of all, every good gift, and second of all, every perfect gift. Now, James is nuancing something here. He's saying, first of all, everything that is good for me, God will give it to me. If I don't have it, it's because it's not good for me at that moment or at that time. Perfect gift then speaks of um, everything I have that is good God has given me. So you see the nuance there. Everything I've got that's good has been given to me by God. Therefore, I can trust him that it, everything that will be good for me, God will make sure I get it. I'll get the right thing, the right time, in the right way. I can trust That God is good. I can trust that God is good. Indeed, he is. He's good in that he gave me his son, Jesus. He graciously gives me everything, not just, not just you know, the bare minimum to get through life. I don't just survive because of God. I thrive because of him. Why? Because every good gift and every perfect gift he has given to me. Now, I said earlier we could look at Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to do just that. I want us to take a moment and kind of look at some passages in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. It's what we've done with several of these commands uh, to see how Jesus applied them in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, while he's not addressing covetousness directly here, like he did with adultery or like he did with killing, um, like he does in other places with honor your father and mother. I, I believe he is getting to the heart of covetousness here, the cause of it. And I want to just suggest three safeguards about stuff. 
three safeguards about stuff. All right. And that's what we're going to kind of close out with. First of all, the first thing I want us to see here is I want you to beware of what you want. Beware of what you want. Look at what Jesus says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And he gives us three reasons why. Moth destroys, rust destroys, and three thieves break in and steal. So with the moth, with the rust, and with the thieves, the moth, things just, um, things deteriorate. Things depreciate. And with thieves, things disappear. There, we got them all with Ds. No matter how much stuff that you collect, the stuff you collect, either it's going to fall apart because nothing is made to be eternal or perfect. Nothing is made, I mean, everything loses its value over the course of time. Uh, even something that may for a while gain value, there's going to come a time where it be, it's going to begin to rust no matter how hard you take care of it, because nothing is eternal or somebody's going to take it away from you. It's vulnerable. So basically our stuff is vulnerable. Be care of these things you want. He gives us an alternative though, but so here treasures on earth, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth does not destroy and rust does not destroy Thieves do not break in and steal. And look at this principle, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we put too much stock in stuff, we commit the sin of unbelief because we do not believe God is good. We don't believe Romans 8, 31 and 32, that God will graciously give us all things. We do not believe James 1, 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. So it does us, it does us good every now and then to stop and do a little self-awareness exercise. Do I want too much stuff? Am I putting, why do I want this? Do I want this because I feel like the object itself is going to do something for me or do I want this so that God can use it to be a blessing for others? Beware of what you want. Don't lay up, don't amass earthly stuff. Um, one of our dear church members who just recently passed away uh, here at our church had a way of saying all the time, he said, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. The idea behind that was no matter how much stuff we accumulate here on earth, we're going to leave it behind. So beware what you want. The second caution I would give us then is to trust God with what, trust God with what you need. Um, don't be anxious about your life, Jesus said. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you'll put on. I mean, those are some things to kind of, you know, we got to eat. We got to hydrate or we'll die. Uh, we don't want to go around naked. We can't do that, you know. Um, but he says life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Then he gives us some example. The birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at this statement. Are you not of more value than they are? You're more precious than the birds, and God takes care of the birds. You can count on God to take care of you. Which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider, he says now, the lilies of the field. Second example, how they grow. They don't toil or spin. In other words, they don't make their own clothes. They don't work. 
uh, to grow the things they need to make themselves look the way they look. But he said, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, but if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how will he not, there we are, there's our word again, much more clothe you. And he identifies the problem. Oh, you of little faith. Trust God. Trust in the goodness of God. Trust in the greatness of God, that God is in control. Trust in the graciousness of God, that God is going to give to you, not based on what you deserve, but on, on the, 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 God isn't great on the curve. He, he grazes on the cross and he's going to graciously give to you because of what he's invested in you through his son, Jesus. Trust that God is good, that he's great, that he's gracious. Trust that God is glorious and that there's nothing greater uh, that you could turn to and depend on and trust than him. And there's nothing you need fear because God is glory. But what to do? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that he lists up here will be added to you. You take care of what you can take care of and let God take care of what God can take care of. Evaluate yourself. If you hoard a bunch of stuff, if you find yourself constantly struggling financially because of all that you buy and Ask yourself, am I really trusting God to provide what I need? And then the final uh, safeguard against stuff that I would share with you is this. The third one is be satisfied with what you have. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do not be anxious. What is the opposite of anxious? To be at peace or to be satisfied? Learn to be satisfied with what you have, knowing that in what you have, if you need anything else, your Heavenly Father is going to provide it for you. We consume so much and our, in 20th century, 21st century, excuse me, America, we did in the 20th century too. We are consumers. We use it up. And the more we buy into stuff, the more we depend on the stuff we buy. I'm going to leave you with this thought. If we're not careful, our possessions begin to possess us instead of recognizing the Lord is my shepherd. One final thing. One of the most misquoted verses in all the Bible, or misapplied verses in all the Bible, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Boy, we apply that to all sorts of difficult situations. But if you look at it in the context, Philippians 4, Paul is saying, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be filled. I know what it's like to be um, have plenty. I know what it's like to suffer need. I know what it's like to abound. And I know what it's like to be destitute. I know both ends of the spectrum. And he said, but I have learned, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I've learned to be content. And then the very next thing he says, how does he learn to be content? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we look to Christ, when we trust in Christ, when we trust in the goodness, greatness, gloriousness, and graciousness of God, as he has shown to us in Christ, we don't have to worry about our things. We can trust God to bring what we need, when we need it, and in the manner that we need it. I could go on, I could spend so much time telling you about ways that God has miraculously provided for me and my family out of the blue. And um, I just, I can tell you God is good. You can trust him. So let's lose 
our grasp on things. We can't hold open hands to God to receive what God has for us if we constantly have closed hands holding on to what we have. Come to God with open hands. Let go of what you have. Trust God to fill your hands with what God wants you to have. So I hope this is a blessing and encouragement to you. God bless you. Uh, we're finishing up the Ten Commandments here. Now we're going to start with something new next week, um, and then we'll go from there. But I hope these commands have been a blessing to you and you've seen them in a fresh uh, New Testament light. We'll see you next time.